There was a time when the name of Polycrates, who had ruled the Greek island of Samos in the 6th century BC, was synonymous with success. He had climbed his way to absolute power amid an age of turbulence on Samos, as the Persian Empire was making rapid gains on the Ionian mainland to the east, and the aristocracy that had governed the island since olden days was teetering. A small but fiercely loyal faction had supported Polycrates' revolution, alongside his two brothers Pantagnotus and Solosan. Brothers and allies he soon did away with to secure Samos for himself alone, putting Pantagnotus to death and sending Solosan into exile. But in time, once he had won his new power through blood, cunning, and conviction, he had wielded it wisely and well, earning the respect of onlookers around the Greek world. Polycrates of Samos was what the Greek thinkers called a tyrant, and his government was a tyranny, a government won outside the established conventions of law built not upon a constitution or a dynastic claim, but the personal charisma of a single leader, the ascent of the people and the army to his will, and the achievements that he relied on as tangible proof of his right to rule. Though he was feared, Polycrates was equally admired, and he lorded over the island with an iron fist or a velvet glove as the circumstances called for. Under Polycrates, Samos flourished with new temples and public spaces. He recruited craftsmen from around the Mediterranean world and paid them handsomely to see through ambitious designs, monuments to project prosperity and goodwill for all to see. An impressive shrine dedicated to the patron goddess Hera new constructions for the capital city's harbor, and a grand aqueduct planned by the famed engineer Eupolinos, bored straight through a mountain by two teams working on each end, a marvel that awed the ancient world. Poets, physicians, and intellectuals thrived on the island, well patronized by Polycrates' regime. And not only in culture, but in war, Samos grew strong. As a soldier and a leader, Polycrates had earned a reputation for victory, and he transformed Samos into the mightiest seafaring power of the day, ordering up a brand new fleet of a hundred fifty oared ships and casting them against any rivals he saw fit to conquer or plunder. In the prime of his life, at the pinnacle of worldly success, the tyrant Polycrates had it all. But mortals should take heed, for the gods demand that every life but theirs has its even share of triumph and sorrow. And a lifetime without grief they keep only for themselves. Polycrates cultivated diplomatic relations with other powers in the Mediterranean world, and the most valuable of these alliances was with the land of Egypt, then ruled over by the pharaoh Ahmos II, or, as the Greeks called him, Amasis. What became a genuine friendship began as a matter of expediency, for Polycrates' fleet made a crucial ally for Egypt against Persian advances. Assurances of support between Samos and Egypt were exchanged, and over time the ties of formal diplomacy engendered a bond of mutual trust. From Polycrates' friendship with Amasis, a famous legend arose, passed down to posterity in the pages of the historian Herodotus. The legend tells of the tyrant the pharaoh, the curse of a ring, and the price of incurring the jealousy of the gods. Amasis was a thoughtful and wise man, 
and Polycrates's extraordinary success didn't escape his notice. And so the wary pharaoh, fearfully reverent toward the gods, penned a message to the tyrant of Samos and sent his greetings with haste. Hearing always of the great fortune of a friend is a pleasure to be sure, the pharaoh wrote. But I meet this news with caution, too, for I know well that the gods are jealous, and in all truth, I want for myself and my friends a fair mixture of the good and the bad, a life of prosperity and loss together. From everything I have learned, no one who has had only success on and on and on wasn't ruined in the end done in by a terrible fate. So, my dear friend, here is my wish for you. Think of what is most precious to you, something you would ache in your heart to lose, and throw it away where it can never be found again. Measure your success with sorrow, grieve for what you lose, and avoid the spite of the gods who rule us all. Polycrates read the pharaoh's letter, and being a careful man himself, took the advice to heart. And he set his mind to choosing a treasure that he held dearest of all, whose loss would cause him grief. At last he made his choice. There was a ring he wore, of wondrous craft that he prized above all, an emerald set in gold, the fine work of Theodorus, the son of Telecles of Samos. Pained at the thought of losing it, he resolved to cast it away, as Amasis advised, and he embarked on a ship out to the deep waters of the open sea. When he was far from the island, he took off his treasured ring and hurled it away into the swelling sea where it would be lost forever under the dark waves of the Aegean. When the deed was done, he sailed back to his capital with a heart full of sorrow. But five or six days later, the tyrant was met with a surprise. A humble fisherman had sailed from the coast of Samos and made the greatest catch of his life. He decided to bring the fish to Polycrates' palace and present it to him as a gift. Entry was granted to the fisherman, and in his lord's presence he said, Great leader, I am a simple man who lives by the sea, but when I caught this fish, it seemed worthy to me of you, and so here I bring it now and offer it to you. Polycrates was grateful and pleased by the fisherman's words. He said in reply, I give you double thanks for what you've offered me, both your kind words and your gift, and I ask you for the pleasure of your dining here with me. The fisherman beamed, astounded by the honor, and went home before the meal was prepared. But when the great fish was brought back to the kitchens, and the servants cut it open to fix the dinner. Out from the fish's guts tumbled the gold and emerald ring that Polycrates had sacrificed to the sea. The servants recognized it as his and carried it with joy to its rightful owner. They gave it to him and told him how they had found it in the belly of the prize fish. Polycrates saw the hand of the gods in this turn of events, and he wrote a letter to Amasis in Egypt, telling him about the ring he had willingly lost and how it had found its way back. The letter arrived at the pharaoh's court, and when Amasis had read it, his hands fell in despair. No man could save another from what fate had in store. This he knew. It was too late for Polycrates, who was so fortunate beyond all human limit, 
that even what he threw away in the depths of the sea would return to his hands. The gods had marked him for a dreadful end. Sorrowfully, Amasis sent a messenger to Samos with news that their alliance was to be broken and their friendship renounced. Whenever it came that Polycrates would meet his doom, the pharaoh would be far from his ruin and spare himself his grief for a friend. Whether or not this tale passed down in ancient lore is true. The outcome would speak for itself. Polycrates' downfall was indeed soon to come. In the last years of the tyrant's reign, the Persian king Cambyses II had succeeded his father, Cyrus the Great. In the year 525, Persia ultimately saw through what the pharaoh Amasis had most feared and invaded the land of Egypt. Amasis himself had died the year before and never lived to see the fall of his kingdom, which would stay under Persian domination until the days of Alexander the Great. With Persia's empire grasping the boundaries of the Mediterranean Sea, Samos faced an ever-expanding wall of Persian opposition just to the east, on the Ionian coast of Asia Minor. It was in the year 522 that word came to Polycrates' court on the island from a certain satrap of the empire, the governor of the former kingdom of Lydia, which was now a Persian province that bordered Samos on the mainland coast. The satrap's name was Aroites, and he, like Polycrates, was an ambitious man. He had heard much of the tyrant's reputation, and whether for personal glory, or some cause for revenge, or a bigger plan to capture the island as Persian land, he plotted to destroy the ruler of Samos. In his message to Polycrates, he played the victim, claiming to fear for his life from the Persian king Cambyses, who had turned his back on him. He begged for Polycrates' support and friendship to come and rescue him from the grip of danger in Lydia. And in return, he would offer the tyrant untold riches from the fabled wealth of Lydia. As proof of the claim, he would gladly receive anyone Polycrates should send to see the truth of the treasures that were promised. Polycrates listened intently to the Persian messenger. Perhaps by the advantage of having a valuable ally, or perhaps by the luster of gold and jewels, the lord of Samos was taken in. He sent an officer of his own to Aroites' court to learn for certain that the treasure was real. And once there, the officer was shown eight massive heavy chests that once opened, sparkled with fabulous wealth inside. The officer returned to Samos and revealed everything to Polycrates, who was now convinced that the offer of money and friendship was true. But little did either of them know that the treasure chests were a trick, filled mostly with stones, except for one layer of gold over the top to fool the eyes. Polycrates declared that he himself would undertake the journey and receive the satrap Oroites and his payment. Advisors cautioned against him going straight into enemy territory, but he paid them no heed. And even more ominous was the dream that his daughter had when she saw her father lifted high up in the air where he was washed by Zeus and anointed by Helios, god of the sun. Afraid of the meaning of the dream, she tried to keep her father from leaving Samos, but not even her prayers and her tears could stop him. He boarded one of the fine ships he had built 
and sailed away with a company of friends and ministers, but without his army, believing that his success and good fortune wouldn't fail him now. But just as the old pharaoh had feared, fate had evil designs for Polycrates, and his luck had run out. When he arrived at the satrap's home in the city of Magnesia, he and his men were trapped and imprisoned. Oroites killed the tyrant Polycrates and nailed his corpse high up on a cross. As he hung in the air day after day, a trophy of the cunning satrap, his body was buffeted by the rain and scorched by the midday sun washed by Zeus, and anointed by Helios. And so his daughter's dream came true. What the pharaoh Amasis had dreaded was realized, and the jealous gods had balanced Polycrates' lifetime of fortune with a ruinous end. <laughs>